Clear's book, Atomic Habits, he explains that when we approach something we want to change, we tend to focus first on the outcomes, and then we try to create a system that we think will help us reach those outcomes. Let's use losing weight as an example. Most people start by setting a goal weight and then creating a diet and exercise plan to get them there. Some people actually achieve their goals, but statistics show that most do not. Either they give up after a while, or they reach their goal weight in the short term, but soon they return to their old habits and the weight comes right back on. The problem, according to the author, is having the wrong starting point. If we want results that last, the right place to begin is with identity rather than outcomes. We must decide what kind of person we want to be, and then make sure our day-to-day -day actions align with that identity. Would a thin and healthy person choose an apple or a donut? Would he skip the gym or consistently show up for himself in that way? Once we know what kind of identity we want, we can start to be intentional about behaving in ways that align with that identity, and the outcomes will naturally take care of themselves. Now think about how the education of children is most often approached. The focus is usually on results, on outcomes. Whether we're talking about state standards, national standards, wisdom and virtue, or a body of core knowledge designed to initiate new generations of young people into traditional Western thought, we tend to be very outcomes focused. When we begin by focusing on outcomes, our objective becomes to create the system that we think will get students and teachers to achieve those outcomes most efficiently. Some of the elements of these systems that are frequently seen today are classrooms and co-ops that are heavily teacher-led, textbooks that merely skim information, an emphasis on memorization, and tests that assess the shallowest learning. This happens even though teachers and principals know it does not align with how children learn. Worse, the person, whether we're talking about the student or the teacher, is practically an afterthought. Mason flipped that model around. She believed that the right place to begin was not with the outcomes, but with the person. If she could discern a robust and cohesive vision of a person's traits, needs, intellectual, and moral potentials, then she could structure her teaching methods and curriculum to be in alignment with that, and the outcomes would take care of themselves. But here's the rub. Since persons vary, the outcomes would be anything but standard. The inability to measure, to quantify, and to compare learners makes many educators very uncomfortable. But for Mason, it was a non-issue. Persons who were allowed to develop fully according to their gifting and interests, while also growing in character and wisdom, and cultivating an appreciation for those things that lie outside their gifting, would be equipped to contribute uniquely to the world in ways large and small. This was a radical idea then, and it remains radical today. But the natural outcome of this approach is flourishing. Not only is this a much higher purpose than achievement, but when society is full of people who are flourishing, it becomes better for everyone. In the next few videos, we will break Mason's philosophy down to its foundation. We'll explain what we believe were her theological underpinnings, her anthropology, or view of the person, her ontology, or what she believed education was for, her teleology, or what she believed to be the nature of knowledge and learning, and her epistemology, or how she knew when her students had learned something well.